We're online with everybody. Shabbat Shalom. We've got uh, we've got a, we got a full room online. Terry, yes, sir. Would you open us up in prayer, please? Yes. Okay. Father, we thank you. We come to you today, and we bless your holy name. Father, we thank you that we have the opportunity to learn from the mistakes of others, whether it's those that are several thousand years ago or right next to us just a minute ago, if there was one. Father, we just thank you, and we love you, we praise you, we honor you. We thank you for your word. Father, your Hamashiach. Father, we lift up Sandy. You know what's going on with her, that there would be no complications of what is going on. Father, we lift up Joe and Dave as they are looking for more of a permanent home. As far as permanent can be on this earth. We lift up Eddie and Tammy for financial lessons, lessons um, assistance, blessings with everybody that they help, Father, and what they've been going through with their vans and trailers and everything. Father, we lift up Pastor John as he and Sandy both shoulder this church. And we ask that you bless them. Father, please send God workers into the fields. Father, you know what we need, and we know that you are our provider, and we thank you for that. And we bless you. We ask that you bless the reading of your word and the studies that we get from it. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Sorry for the outburst. I was also trying to link in over it to, to see how the Facebook was connected well. But we've got, so we've got someone joining us over at the International House of Prayer Facebook. So, so it's good to have you there. Um see if there's anything else but okay well um i i think it's very interesting by the way about what is happening in the world and how it relates to this tour portion and i don't know if you guys and we'll get to that here in a little bit but this week's tour portion is anybody hint hint cora cora and it is Numbers 16, 1 through 18, 23. And I have a question for y'all. Why do we do tour portions? Repetition of the word. Repetition of the word? Yeah, because of the, the cycle. It's just like a game you play. You do it over and over and you stay good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? This year is always different from last year because the word is always growing. Uh huh. And so when we read through and read back through, the Father grows us a little more. It's a little bit, means something a little bit different this year than it did last year. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why is it a little bit different? It's living. It's, living. it's, living. it's, living. it's changing. It's changing. Yeah. Growing. Yeah. And, and we're going through these different cycles and uh, we go through different stages of life and it impacts us differently every time. But it also reminds us so many things that we just forget. I mean, how many if, if you went through the tour portion and you think, well, I know this story, I know this story, I know this story. But when you go back and read it, it's like, well, huh, I forgot about that. Yeah. Or I didn't see that last time. Isn't that interesting? I also like to take and think of it as. How else can the father get everybody on the same page around the world so they know what he's doing? So if something is about to happen or something is happening that people can look at and say, oh, my goodness, there it is. Isn't that 
and we're all on the same page. How else do you get everybody else on the same page? I mean, so, so think about this in churchianity and you have all these Christian churches that are out there throughout the world. They're all going to meet tomorrow. And how many messages are there going to be? As many as there are churches. Many as there are churches. Yeah. And so, well, and you can look at, well, at different gatherings and congregations that are meeting today and setting the tour portion. We're going to be looking, probably focusing on different things, different themes, but there's a particular, but the spirit is speaking yeah. all on the same thing. And how else can we therefore have something resonate? Because it, it may not even be said, but by a spirit, that soft, still voice might speak something very loudly in every one of us as we go through it. So I always think it's very interesting. Uh, there was a comment in here. Uh, Blazing Torch says, because the Holy One told us to. Joe said, uh, hope is true. Teaches Linda says, it teaches us something new every time. And... So those are those are all really great, great comments. And so the meaning, Korah, what's it mean? Because even though that's a guy's name, it has a meaning. One of the meanings is bald. bald. Okay. Another uncovered. huh? Uncovered. Un it's another one that I've heard. Uncovered. Yes. Yes. Uncovered. Which, you know, maybe he had a full head of hair. Maybe he didn't. I mean, mama, daddy, you know, named him when he was born. So by the time he was old, was he like uh, Elisha? Do you know Elisha was bald? No. Yeah. Yeah. Remember the incident with the bears? No, not the bears. The incident with the kids. The kids were mocking Elisha as he was walking down the road. And, and so Elisha cursed the kids and the bears came out and mauled the kids because they were, call, they were calling him, hey, Baldy. Where is that? Uh, it's, it's there. It's there. Yeah. So isn't that interesting? So it means uncover. There's a really good book by his name john we have him in in our in our bookstore john b begins with a b john john what's his name john somebody help me out okay it's called uncovered really really good the book is called uncovered and uh and it goes in and it be, really goes into depth of what does it mean to live life as a believer uncovered now there's a doctrinal belief that the, like the baptists believe that uh that it's okay f for women to speak if she has the covering of the husband have you ever heard that doctrinal belief yeah, yes. okay is that is that a biblical belief no, it's a doctrinal belief that the Baptists believe. And many other denominations do believe the same thing. But uh, but when Paul clarifies that there's neither male nor female, there's neither Jew nor Gentile Three. in the body. No, that's not the author. It's John Bevere. John Bevere. Okay. Maybe he wrote a book like that, but I'm thinking about the one by John Bevere. So really, really good book. Highly recommend it. In fact, most of the works by John Bevere are awesome. Very, very good. They will make, it will uncover things in your heart. Okay. All right. So let's, let's get into this tour portion and let's look at some things and, uh, and maybe pull some, tie some things together that's going on in current events right now. So if I can get somebody to read, somebody that can speak nice and loud and, uh, and, um, I don't want to, and let me just say this, someone that can read loud and fast. Undercover. Undercover. Oh, I said uncover. Undercover. You're right. Undercover. So I make that correction for my peanut gallery online. No, we're the peanut gallery. Okay. Thank you. No peanuts right yet. That's a good voice. Huh? That's a good 
That was a good voice. It was. Read. Brenda, would you read for us? <laughs> I hate to, I'm not <laughs> okay, I'll read it. It's fine. All right, let's go. Number 16, one. Now, Korah, the son of Itzhar, and the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with uh, Dathan and Aviram, Aviram, the sons of Eliab and the sons of Pelas. See, nobody wants to read because they don't want to read the names. I get it. Sons of Reuben took action and they stood and they rose up before Moses together with some of the sons of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation chosen in the assembly, men of renown. I'm going to sit down. Okay. There we go. Men of renown. And they assembled together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far. Or you've gone far enough for all the congregation are holy, every one of them. And Yahweh is in their midst. So why do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of Yahweh? Then Moses heard this. He fell on his face and he spoke to Korah and all his company saying, tomorrow morning, Yahweh will show who is his and who is holy and will bring him near to himself. Even the one whom he will choose, he will bring near to himself. Now I have to stop right there and ask the question, is not all of Israel holy? What is, um, look, first off, in order to say that, we have to say um, holy. What does that mean? So okay. Oh. So was not Israel set apart from Egypt? Egypt representing the world. Israel was set apart. Are they not holy? Okay. So did you ever think about... What was that? Supposed to be, but yet they're adulterers. Okay. Did you ever think about... We can be set apart. For good, for y'all's purposes, or have you ever thought about those that are set apart for evil? So by this definition of holy, we really have to define what that is. Isn't it interesting how religion can take things and just throw enough truth in to say, well, it sounds like that's right. It's coming on the right track. Just like I said earlier, is that, well, it's okay for women to speak and to teach if they have the covering of their husband. In other words, if their husband approves, <laughs> then a woman can speak. Is that, well, I can is say, that biblical? I can say for somebody that was raised in the era that I was, where you didn't do any didn't do anything without your husband's permission. Not even reading Bible verse. Uh -huh. It's awful hard to accept. Yeah. When tradition is, is louder than truth, what do people do? They're going to listen to tradition. Okay. All right. Uh, Blazing Torch, you put in there Amos 3, 7. Why don't you type that or copy that into the notes i'm trying to get caught up with the notes here too oh my goodness somebody this week on, in my study i don't know where said that they have recently talked to someone that has heard uh the arabs uh speak to the uh Korox, bunch of people at the river with the phrase that's Say that again. What? Well, that was just while well, I was cat hair. I thought uh, the people, people for years, uh -huh. lived over there. Yeah. Have heard people talking from the ground around the river, uh, river yes. Euphrates. Okay, those voices coming out because uh, the water level's gone down, and now the voices they're hearing voices through the caves there that were covered up. Okay. He said years ago, he said this Monday on the most recent together. That they Arabs had heard <clears throat> Korah in his group 
saying, listen to Moses. He was right. Wow. Okay, interesting. Okay, so Al says in here, I think he put in there Amos 3, 7, for... Um, He's, he typed, for the Lord Adonai will do nothing unless he has revealed his counsel to his servants, the prophets. That goes back, yeah, that was actually a prior note. That really goes into what the Torah portions actually do, because the Torah portions are prophetic. Yes, they are. So um, I saw something else being talking about set apart. Blazing Torch said, um, set apart for God's exclusive use. And... So, and I, when I speak of Israel, I'm talking about two different parts, the descendants of Jacob and anybody that's grafted in. So, uh, so the mixed multitude, Bob's right, mixed multitude, is, if they're grafted in, fall under that same family. All right, Israel, which means prince. Okay, uh, Korah's Rebellion. So where were we? So we're talking about this set apart. And, he's, and he says, okay, so tomorrow God's going to choose his own. Verse 6, do this. Take censers for yourselves, Korah and all your company. And let me check something out here. Or specifically... And all his company is what that really is. And it says, and put fire in them and lay incense upon them in the presence of Yahweh tomorrow. And the man whom Yahweh chooses shall be the one who is holy, who is set apart. You have gone far enough, you sons of Levi. Then Moses said to Korah, hear, Shema, hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it not enough for you that that the God of Israel has separated you from the rest of the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself and to do the service of the tabernacle of Yahweh and to stand before the congregation to minister to them and that he has brought you near Korah and all your brothers, sons of Levi with you. And are you seeking for the priesthood also? Therefore, let me ask you, so what is Korah's intent? So who, because all the sons of Levi are who? Yeah, they're, they're, set they're set apart. Okay. And, they're but not all the, priests. not all the sons of Levi are priests, right? So who is actually qualified to be the priests? The, the sons of Aaron. Sons of Aaron. Yeah, okay, so we're just saying that to clarify. And, and verse 10, and he brought you uh, near Korah and all your brothers, sons of Levi, with you. And are you seeking for the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against Yahweh. But as for Aaron, who is he that you grumble against him? Now, keep in mind, it's not just Korah. Who is he? Who has he uh, aligned himself with? Two hundred and fifty of the other leaders. And specifically, who are the two from Reuben? Dathan and Abiram. Okay, I'm going to say it like an American would. <laughs> Dathan and Aviram. 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 Okay. Then Moses, verse 12, sent a summons to Dathan and Aviram, the sons of Eliav. And they said, but they said, we will not come up. Is it not enough that you have brought us out of the land flowing with milk and honey to have us die in the wilderness? But you would also lord it over us? Okay. So here's another point. Yeah, but what about this thing about the land of milk and honey? What did they? What did they just say to Yahweh? His land wasn't good enough. Tammy, that's a really good point. Yep. 
that's a really good point because what are they saying? Where did they come from? They called where they came from the land flowing with milk and honey. Okay. What is that? What, what is he, what, what are they saying by making that comment? They want to do a U-turn and go back. Okay, so our, so let's we're putting this this thing in a historical perspective. They left Egypt. They're out in the wilderness. It's dry and it's barren, and there's nothing around. They have to rely on Yahweh to feed them and to give them water every single day. It, and there's nothing green growing. They can't grow anything. There's no garden to go pull up some onions and garlic from. They're you know they don't have the Nile River to go fish in. They have uh, they they don't have this abundance of their flocks. I mean, when it's flowing with milk and honey, what is what does milk represent? Goats and cows, right? Uh, honey, what does that represent? Bees. Pollinate, pollinating, yes, where you're going to have the, the nice things. I mean, after all, everybody likes their sweets and treats, okay? So, they're comparing it, but are they not saying, look, uh, you call, you said you're, you're, you, we were going to go somewhere and you haven't delivered. How short is their memory? They're telling God, is this all you've got? Is this the best you've got and challenging his authority? Yeah. They're the very ones that believed the 10 spies whose bad report gave them 40 years. Their dream and their vision has absolutely been wiped out and they would rather go back to Egypt to have milk and honey rather than die in the wilderness as they were told. But so would happen that they would all die in the wilderness. It's only their children that would, would be able to enter into the land. I think they're a little disgruntled. Yeah. So if they're really disgruntled with the situation, are they, who are they really disgruntled with? With Yah. With Yah. And, but they're taking it out on who? Moses. So what does that tell us about what it means to be part of a gathering of people, a congregation, a community, a state, a nation? Better know what they believe and stand for. So think about this. When there's the people are disgruntled, who puts the who puts the people into authority? Who puts the people that are in authority into those positions? How do they get there? How did Moses get there? God put him there. He's appointed. We have a president or we have a person filling the office of the presidency right now. Because Why? Because somebody somebody tainted the, the the computers and there was fraud and so therefore that Yahoo is in office. Or did we get that person that is in authority because God put him there? Why? I mean, yeah. Why? Because yes, all sorts of you can name the corruption. We don't. We could fill all every single single bit of corruption to fill this entire room up of how that person got into office. There's so much historical data and so much fraud and so much abuse and so many different things that wrangled its way to get that person, that person who was one of the most horrible senators for 30 years, and that person in I won't go there is there. Why? Because this nation chose to turn its back on God. So God gave us 
uh, someone who we needed. The one we deserved. And so we think about that. Okay, God's appointed and anointed. Do we have a problem thinking that way? We're certainly not a, not anointed in the sense of a biblical sense, right? I would, I would I would think that, but but nevertheless, if we think about the principles of leadership, when God puts someone into position, if there's complaint against that person, then who are we really complaining against? We're complaining against God, and. So and now you can br now break it all down and you say, well, I don't know if I completely believe all of that. And I'm going to tell you, I've got my complaints about certain things that have happened and the corruptions and all that. I get that. I understand that. But on the other hand, uh, we could. We just got to keep keep things uh, in perspective. I someone. OK. Sometimes someone will text me uh, relating to the Torah portion and, and it's just go to the chat, but that wasn't from somebody in the, in there. Okay. But every nation, by the way, we, it can get kind of complicated because we have kingdom versus kingdom. And I want to suggest that perhaps this whole thing, what they call Korah's rebellion, is about kingdom versus kingdom. Because a nation divided against itself, y'all finish it. Cannot stand. Cannot stand. So if we keep this, that, that truth in perspective. What is the chief mission of Hasatan? To divide and conquer. To divide and conquer. Right? How does he destroy a congregation? Divide. Divide and conquer. We've I'm I'm telling you, I think we've had three splits here at Life of Worship. Wow. Why? Because of this spirit, the Korok spirit coming in. And in fact, in fact, it sounded when it's come in before, it sounded very much. You've got too much on your plate. I think you should sit down and take a break. We can come in and fill in for three or four months and 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 take care of things. Oh, we, we don't like exactly how you do it, but I think it's because you're stressed. Doesn't that sound like, oh, we want to take care of you. We want to make sure things are done. Or I think you're making decisions because all of these things are weighing upon you. We'll take those things off your shoulders. I'm telling you, those are things that we've heard before. Oh, we've, also, we've also heard the different things like, oh, you're evil and we're going to pick up our toys and go home and take a lot of people with us. <laughs> we've, we've heard in so many words, those type of things, but why? Because it's kingdom versus kingdom. And it's not that, you know, where Sandy and I could say, we're just ready just to uh, hand over the ministry and close the doors and walk away. Uh, you know how easy that would be just to say, Okay, whatever, we're done. But but we can't because it has to do with we were appointed to do something with a congregation in Amarillo that it obviously is affecting people all around the country. And in, even when you look at the number of people that come in and watch our tour portions and be a part of our ministry from watching the, the archives, there's a lot of people that join in and they, they check us out. They want to hear what we're having to say. And, and how it's all relating. And, and um, so we know that this is a lot bigger than just us here. And you guys are part of that. And you're helping us continue with that. So this challenge to authority 
is really serious and God takes it very seriously. And, and so, but if, isn't it interesting that, that they are given an extra test? So what is this test that they're given? Verse 11, therefore you and all your company are gathered together against Yahweh. But as for Aaron, who is he that, that you grumble against him? The Moses sent a summons to Dathan and Aviram, the sons of Eliav. And they said, we will not come up. And is it not enough that you brought us up out of the land of flowing of milk and honey to have us die in the wilderness, but you would also lord it over us? Indeed, you have not brought, it, brought us up into the land flowing up into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor have you given us an inheritance of fields and vineyards. In other words, you said it, but it didn't happen. How many times do we want that? I mean, how many times do we say, you know, I'm really hungry for that steak dinner, but I don't want to wait for it now. I, I want it now, you know, feed me now. Right. When you, when you smoke a meat, Oh, you're hungry right? You're hungry for that. But how long are you going to wait for it? What? Eight hours? Overnight? Right? To get a good, good uh, brisket? Okay, I'm getting hungry. Okay, so, but a lot of times we don't want it. So we'll set, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just go to Whataburger. Well, I'll get my beef anyway. It may not taste as good. <laughs> But what happens if you just wait for it? Okay, so think about this. But you, you promised the brisket, and I want it now. Well, you got to wait for it. Verse 15, then Moses became very angry and said to Yahweh, do not regard their offerings. I have not taken a single donkey from them, nor have I done harm to any of them. In other words, if if Moses is a prime minister, literally, that's what he is. He's like the president. He's the, uh, uh, commander in chief of all of Israel. Don't you think that he could have taken like a, I, everybody bring you 1% of what you have. He could have asked that. Um, <laughs> One tenth of one percent. Yeah. Okay. And he could have done that. But he says, I'm not even taking a single donkey. I'm doing this for free. So, and Moses said to Korah, you and all your company be present before Yahweh tomorrow, both you and they, along with Aharon, Aaron, and each of you take his fire pan and put incense on it. And each of you bring a censer before Yahweh, 250 fire pans. Also you and Aaron shall each bring his fire pan. So they each took his own censer and put fire on it and laid incense on it. And they stood at the doorway of the tent of meeting with Moses and Aaron. Then Korah assembled all the congregation against them at the door of the tent of meeting. And the glory of Yahweh appeared to all the congregation. Now, Eddie and Tammy brought this out on Monday's latest reason together. Did anybody get to listen to that? Okay about these censors isn't it now where where are the levites and the priests supposed to obtain their coals from for the censors the altar the altar Verse 20, then Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron said, separate yourselves from among the congregation that I may consume them instantly. But this is talking about Aaron and Moses, but they fell on their faces and said, oh God, thou God of the spirits of all flesh, when one man sins, wilt thou be angry with the entire congregation? Then Yahweh spoke to Moses, speak to the congregation, said, get away or get back from all around the dwellings of Korah, Dathon, uh, uh, Dathan, Dathan, and Aviram. Then Moses arose and went to Dathan and Aviram and the elders of Israel following him. And he spoke to the congregation saying, depart now from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing that belongs to them, lest you be swept away in all their sins. So they came back from around the dwellings of Korah, uh, 
going on, I'll skip the names, came out. These guys came out and stood at the doorway of their tents along with their wives and their sons and their little ones. And Moses said, by this you shall know that Yahweh has sent me to do all these deeds, for this is not my doing. If these men die the death of all men, or if they suffer and the fate of all men, then Yahweh has not sent me. But if Yahweh brings about an entirely new thing and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them with all that is theirs and they descend alive into Sheol, then you will understand that these men have spurned Yahweh. Then it came about as he finished speaking all these words that the, the ground that was under them split open. Okay. So Korah and all of them, get, they get swallowed up. Let's go on down. Verse 34, and all Israel who were around them fled at their outcry. And they said, the earth has swallowed us up or the earth has swallowed us up. Fire also came forth from Yahweh and consumed the 250 men who are offering the incense. Where did fire consume individuals before? When Aaron's two sons put on holy fire. When they brought strange fire. It's the same thing. They used strange fire. They didn't even want to follow the protocols. And they didn't either, because in the King James, in verse 24, it says, speaking under the congregation, saying, get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah and David, or, uh, Korah and Jason in the Bible. And what Eddie and Tammy were saying, or asking is, had they made a tabernacle of their own? You know, that's a, a point to ponder. You know, the I'd have to look it up. Um, real quick let's see to see there could be some things embedded in the uh in the hebrew i'm thinking that the word is mishkan a uh, mishkan is the word for the tabernacle and i'm pulling up my e sword so we can actually look at it what verse was that 24 because there's sometimes you know the the, uh, the King James Version, instead of saying tent, it'll say tabernacle. Because that's what tabernacle is. It's just a tent. Is it Mishkan? Okay. So, it, but it lends, it gives you a kind of a pause for thought. But as we think about this, this is something that's being said. What the rabbis have brought out this point. The sages teach that in this Midrash, uh, in Shoher Tov, that Korah told the following parable to the people. A poor widow had a field. When she came to plow it, Moses forbade her to plow it with an ox and an ass together. Then when she began to sow, Moses forbade her to sow it with mingled seeds. At the time of harvest, Moses ordered her to leave the unreaped, uh, to leave unreaped the corners of the field and not to gather up the gleanings, but to leave them for the poor. He furthermore demanded the heave offerings for the priests and the tithe for the Levites. The women sold the field and purchased ewes in the hope that she might live undisturbed. However, when the firstling of the sheep was born, Aaron appeared and demanded it as his due. At shearing time, Moses reappeared and demanded the first of the fleece of the sheep which according to Moses' law was his. He reappeared again and again with new demands till the long-suffering woman slaughtered the sheep and in her anger consecrated it to the sanctuary. Therefore, everything went to Aaron. Such men, Korah concluded, are Moses and Aaron. That sounds like a New Testament church today. Moses, you're way too demanding. Moses, I can't believe you had asked me to give that up. Moses, I can't believe that there's a share and a portion. It's all, Moses and it's all their fault. Yeah, it's not because God said it 
and they just relayed the information to them because they wouldn't go get the information themselves because they wouldn't go and listen from the mountain themselves. Moses, it's just too big for us. It's just too great for us. So, so uh, you go listen and tell us what God is saying. Yeah. And, and therefore, if we don't like what you're saying that God is, you're relaying to God, we can just blame you for it. Isn't that, isn't that what this is really about? Is that, oh, are we not good enough to, do we not hear? Isn't that what Miriam said? And Miriam was struck with leprosy. That same, um, um, uh, what's the word? The evil speaking, the Lashon Hurrah. Yeah. Isn't that what the evil speaking, this, the death that's coming from the tongue, which brings us to this kingdom versus kingdom. It is related to the tongue, uh, the evil tongue, which divides, but it also kills, steals, and destroys. Did God really say? Did God really speak through you, Moses? Can we not hear? Are we not special and set apart and holy like you are? Very careful. <laughs> Okay, let me bring an example up. Happened this week. I sent a text out about Wednesday night because I was so frazzled I totally forgot it was Wednesday and I was out of town and I couldn't do the I couldn't do the uh, the truth about a cancer, the quest for the cure. And which I apologize. I really apologize for not keeping my schedule straight. And so, well, you made a mistake. Maybe somebody else should just more organized, better funded, should just take over. And just that can be here for us to, to, to fill us up with, with all of this stuff because somebody else could should do that because, you know, um, could be an opportunity for Hasatan to come in and with evil speaking – try to divide and kill, destroy. And even though we have our frailties and we mess up, did Moses mess up? Yes. He did mess up. And, and he had his time. He kept him from going into the, to the promised land. Um, but Hasatan will loves to use these circumstances. Why? Because there's two levels that, 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 uh, that we, well, there's actually, we're made out of, Three different things. We are spirit, we are soul, and we are flesh. Soul is made up of, anybody tell me? The mind, the will, and the emotions. The spirit is what was given to us by God. So it was given to Adam. God, God breathed into Adam. He became a living being, a living soul. But God put his spirit in Adam. That's what is eternal. This is the eternal part, the spirit. Yeshua, when confronted by Nicodemus in the middle of the night, says, unless you're born again, born of water and spirit, you have no place in the kingdom. So... So the spirit has to be breathed on by God. But then we have the soul. And both of these live in the flesh, in the body. Now, this flesh has an appetite. What is it like? Everything. Anything, Anything that makes it feel good. Yeah. Whether it's a full belly to fulfilled desires and all that sort of stuff that go with good and bad alike, just feed me. That is the flesh. How do you know if the flesh is ruling over you? It's kind of like, uh, I like what Kenneth Hagin 
uh, has said before and say, uh, Kenneth Hagin, oh no, just a boot. No, he's uh, honestly, Kenneth Hagin said a lot of great things. Yeah. And one of the things he said is that after a meeting one time, he wanted to go out and uh, he said, well, what would you like to have? Well, I'd like to have fried. You've heard me say this. I'd like fried chicken. That's what I really want. I'm hungry. Fried chicken sounds good. Okay, let's go to a good fried chicken place. He said, nope, I'm not going to feed my flesh so that it will have power over me. <laughs> could could be brisket. Just just smoke that thing, and tomorrow we'll feast. Okay. The soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions. Each one of these things wants to rule. However, this one's humble. It will allow the mind, the will, and the emotions, and the flesh rule over it. So therefore. It requires, it does require our will to submit to the spirit and to bring all of this under the spirit so that we can hear what the spirit is saying to know. So it doesn't mean that the soul and the flesh are evil. It's just that they have to be subdued. They're wild. And The lesson here in Korah is telling us one thing, and that is where does the enemy influence? The soul and flesh. The soul and the flesh. The flesh wanted the land flowing with milk and honey. The soul says, that's a really good idea because my belly is rumbling. And, and then how do you entice all the people of Israel? You appeal to the soul and the flesh. They get emotionally involved, say, this person's not doing good enough. That Moses, that rascal, he, he and Aaron, they think they should rule. And they will appeal, this emotional appeal that will supersede the spirit. Because why? The spirit of God already said you're going to the promised land, you're, but because of your disobedience, because the soul and the flesh got involved, it's going to take a little bit longer. But at least live for your children. At least get your children there. And that's what the spirit of God's saying. I mean, we got to think about this because I'm going to tell you this. How many, how many parents are actually raising their children today? How many grandparents are raising the grandchildren? Lots. Why? Because something broke down in the process and the parents decided they weren't going to get their children to the promised land. And it's our responsibility of parents to get our own children there. Because at some point in time, the grandparents and the parents will be superseded. And if their children aren't directed in the right way, they won't make it. So this whole aspect of, of what is the spirit saying, it's not just about us. It's about the next generation. And the kingdom versus kingdom, this thing is going to attack us and attack us and attack us. Why? Why? Because he knows if it can get our flesh and our us emotionally evolved, we'll make the decision that will bring death and destruction. Not only to our to us, but to our children's generation. Because the enemy knows how to feed it. So when we find ourselves getting brought in to people's conversations and their gossip and the Lashon Hurrah. What is it feeding? It's feeding the soul. So when, when we go and we transfer from this life into the next, this right here is not what matters. It's what this matters they're not invited to the party but it's this right here 
Is that what we're held in judgment for? That's what we stand before God. And if you want to think about certain people will get certain rewards, because the Bible talks about rewards that are given, uh, it's based on did we get our soul and flesh to come under the power of the Spirit? And how much did we do that? Your flesh does not care where you spend eternity because it's not going with you. Our flesh doesn't care. Yeah, doesn't care because our yeah, it's not going with us. Live for today. And I know we've all been there, been there, done that. And we live for today without any thought for tomorrow. And so another way to say it is how do we know whether we're living by the spirit? or by the soul in the flesh? By when we're ready to take sides. By whose side we're going to stick with. Are we going to stick with God's appointed? Or the person that says, hey, I'm going to give you milk and honey. I got, an, I got another tabernacle set up. It's pretty cool. Set up a little bit differently. Yeah. And and that little parable that I read right there, I just put various seeds in your field. Don't give to the poor. And after all, those priesthood, they can go work for themselves. So you don't have to support them. They can go make their own living and do all the temple responsibilities. And, and this is what this is about. It's a power struggle. Are we not all, are we not sons of Levi? Should we not share in this responsibility? It's way too heavy for you. So kind of one of these challenges, but really what it boils down to is who's in charge. But, but here's the other thing. If Hasatan can influence, I'm going to use red since I'm marking on my board pretty good. If Hasatan, who comes to kill, steal, and it's not very good red anymore. It didn't show up on the. It doesn't show up very well on the. Nope, not on the board. How about. Yeah, there was a request to use darker colors. Can you see the green? Can you hear me now? Yep. How about black? Black is darker. Okay. Yep. So. This is why the soul and the flesh get opened up to the demonic. Apparently online buffer when you were talking about the fire pans. The fire pans. Okay. Asking if you covered it. You stopped. I stopped on the fire pans? Okay. And something else too. Okay, so in just a refresher, those fire pans had strange fire in them, which is the same thing that happened to the sons of Aaron. And so they were struck by fire. The fire consumed every one of those guys holding the fire pan. Uh, by the way, those fire pans, what are they? So they're the incense, so holding the incense. And what do they do with the fire pans? Yeah, they were used to, um, yeah, it says verse 37, say to Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, that he shall take up the censers out of the midst of the blaze, for they are holy. And, and you scatter the burning coals abroad. Why do you, they want to scatter the burning coals? Because they're strange fire. They, they didn't come out of, from the altar. As for the censors, I mean, that kind of tells you where they're coming from. You know that they're not listening to God. And they totally forgot about Aaron's sons. It's like, oh, you come and you bring your fire pans. Let's see if you really know where to get the fire from. Isn't that interesting? We talk about in, in the, we talk about having the fresh fire of God. And as compared to the strange fire, you think about, so God, I just put your fire in me. And, uh, but how many, 
what I've seen in many, many Christian churches that you might call like charismatic or uh, Pentecostal or prophetic or whatever movement you want to call out there. And they say they want the fire of God. And a lot of times what I've seen is not a lot of times I've seen this where people want the spirit of God so much that they'll take a counterfeit spirit like a kundalini spirit or something like that. They'll take a counterfeit spirit thinking that they're getting the spirit of God because it's something that's they've never experienced before. There's a feeling and yet it is not God. Why? Because it comes back to this thing, the soul and the flesh, strange fire. Okay. So this strange fire, the soul and the flesh, what, what I was going to, uh, going to talk about was Hasatan who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Hasatan who, who divides and conquers, who has this evil tongue, the evil speaking. Sounds good, but if it's not God, it's still evil. Wicked is wicked, no matter how embellished it is. No matter how many truths in it, if it's mixed with the seed of evil, it's evil. So... The soul and the flesh, this is the part that comes under the influence of Hasatan. And that's where we get the idea of demonic oppression. And what is, so what is that? A lot of times people in churches today and in society says, well, one is um, they'll get, they'll get it mixed up with possession. And then they, you start the debate. I know this is really big among the assemblies of God. Oh, a believer cannot be possessed. And so they take it to the next step. A believer cannot be oppressed because there's no room for the one who has the spirit of God living them in them for a to be uh, possessed or oppressed. Now, possession is what we think of as the exorcist, the movie, which I hated so much. I sat down with friends my senior year of high school to watch that movie. Didn't even like horror movies, but that's what everybody was doing. And I'm like, I don't even want to watch that. I fell asleep. So I didn't even watch it. I just saw. Uh, so the only know, thing I know is those little clips that they show, like the green pea spook, you know, puke, you know, that type. That's the only thing I know about that movie is the head spinning around. I don't want to know about that movie. I just don't. I don't even want to think about it. I don't want to think about those trailers. That was more than enough for me. But that's when you think about possession. This is a full embodied. When you think about that, you think about the demoniac. When Yeshua and the disciples come up to the shore on the Sea of Galilee, and he's they're met by this man who is called. No, he's not called, but the demons said, What is your name? And what is Legion? So there were so many. Yeah, because there were so many involved. But what was he? Was he possessed? Well, I would say that he was so heavily influenced, we would probably call him possessed. But in reality, he was oppressed. He was oppressed with so many of these demonic figures that a, a legion being a thousand, that Yeshua said, tells him to go into those pigs. He was no longer oppressed, but he was so there was so much influence on him. His own characteristics, his own character could not be seen. Why? Because that heavy oppression that was upon him influenced both his flesh. Why? He was among the graves and he cut himself. So his own flesh was being afflicted by these demons uh, by the way, that's a sign. People that cut, you know, we have, we we people that are cutters. Uh, there's an issue of demonic oppression. Why? Because it's related to this the the ancient religion. Well, it's not ancient. I mean, they even do it today of this letting of your own blood. 
That's what the prophets of Baal did on Mount Carmel with Elijah. They cut themselves. It is spiritual. It's oppressive. And it's causing them to do things to their body that one would not do normally. Do we normally cut ourselves? Well, only if we're like in the kitchen or we're working on something we don't. It's accidental, right? Yes. Then, so there's the affliction of the flesh that the enemy will do. Why? Because he, he got entrance through with our appetites or to our soul, our mind, our will, and emotions. So what is this? So there's the tormenting of the flesh. There are other torments of the flesh besides one that's a cutter. The torments of the flesh also has, has to do with uh, sickness, disease, illness, a direct spiritual connection of the flesh that have been made by open doors. Maybe it's because our appetites led us so many times eating the wrong stuff that our arteries got blocked or um, we um, these genetically modified foods and the chemicals in it has caused problems within our own bodies, right? Because of appetite and there's a demonic connection. Believe it or not, there's a demonic connection. And there's more than enough resources to show that that health can be connected. Well, what like Sandy, for example, I'll just say this. When Twyla got her gallbladder out, never, she never had a gallbladder issue until Twyla's gallbladder came out. And within two weeks, Sandy had gallbladder problems. Now tell me, is that just coincidence? You know, that thing jumped, said, well, there's not a gallbladder to afflict anymore. So it jumped over to her gallbladder through that family lineage. We were learning stuff at that time. Eventually led to her to have that gallbladder out. So I'm just talking about there is a connection. It wasn't just the two of us, though, because mother and grandmother, my mother and my grandmother. Your mother and your grandmother. So there's one, two, three, four generations right there being jumped from one generation to the next. So what about the afflictions of the soul? Do you have anger issues? Do you have issues of uh, control, manipulation, gossip? All these different things that we call like, well, these are sins that are listed within the Bible. Well, what causes a wagging of the tongue? An uncontrolled soul that may, may, not always, it may just be the weakness of of the soul just can't stand up against and be to, to submit to the spirit. But some, a lot of times it's inspired by the demonic. It's just that we submit to that inspiration. It's just an unclean spirit. So we can either listen to the Holy spirit or an unclean spirit. Who's inspiring us. If we are living towards the spirit this is why it's the spirit that lives in eternity, because this thing just keeps messing up. But if we subdue it, this is what I really think that this is what this life is about. Our mission is so that our spirit can live and dominate. Why? Because in the kingdom versus kingdom, that's how we destroy the kingdom of Hasatan, the kingdom of darkness. But I'll tell you what, if we find ourselves getting uh, emotionally involved in in, in someone else's dilemmas and we begin to pass judgment and all that sort of thing. I'm telling you, that's not from the spirit of God. That's from an uncontrolled soul. And then when our flesh wants to get involved, we just want to get in the middle of that fight. You know, then we got a real mess. It's related to Korah because really we come out from underneath the covering and we want to do things in our own way. I mean, it's, it's like wanting to push something through faster. Oh, that's kind of like Korah's Rebellion. Let's just go back to Egypt. We can get back to Egypt in 12 days because I don't want to wander around the wilderness for 40 more years. Okay. So yeah. Why do you say that with oppression then instead of possession? What would 
possession be? I think I, I think it's possession is is a I think possession comes from a mistranslation and a misunderstanding okay. because uh, because possession implies 100% loss of control. You are simply a robot for an evil entity. But another way to really say oppression uh, is to say, I'm going to have to erase all this, but I'm going to put it here, uh, is to be demonized. Yeshua, in Mark chapter 1, goes to the synagogue, and he is confronted by someone in the congregation. And so he tells that, he tells the demon to, to be quiet. Let's talk, let's look, let's go over there. Uh, Mark chapter 1. Verse 21, Mark 1, 21. And they went to Capernaum and immediately on the Shabbat, he entered the synagogue and began to teach. And they were amazed at his teaching for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And just then there was in their synagogue, a man of an unclean spirit. So see how it says it? He's a man of an unclean spirit. That's how it says the New American Standard. Does anybody have another way it says? King James says with. With an unclean spirit. So it's in other words, he's a man, but there is an unclean spirit involved. He's not possessed. It's just an unclean spirit is involved. And saying, what do we have to do with you, Yeshua of Nazareth? So now um, we find out that it's, there's more than one, but he's a man with these unclean spirits. Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy one of God. And Yeshua rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him and throwing him into convulsions. The unclean spirit cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. And they were all amazed so that they debated among themselves saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And immediately the news about him went everywhere into all the surrounding districts of, of Galilee. Now go down to verse 32. It says, and when evening had come after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all who were ill and those who, who were demon possessed. Okay. I believe that's a mistranslation. It's better. It actually means those who are demonized or vexed with a demon. Okay. The, because think about this in our modern language, when we think that someone's possessed, they are out of control. They are, ro they are robotically moved by a demon. But that's not what it says. It, it, I mean, that's what they, that's how they translate it because it's translated. I believe the translators use um, their paradigm, their doctrinal paradigm, and use that word as opposed to which is actually more so, more accurate, demonized or vexed with a demon. Does anybody have another word that's being used there in your translation? Possessed with devils. Possessed with devils. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's an error of the translators speaking from their doctrinal beliefs, and they use those doctrinal beliefs to translate that. But it's actually demonized or vexed with a demon. It's a person. It's just that they've got a particular thing, a particular personality that seems to show up at particular times. Right? So, for example... And I'll use, I'll use Sandy as the example with the gallbladder. Did her gallbladder bother her 24 seven? No. no, it was just during particular times that, that there would be a flare up and she would be in great pain. And I would have to give her a back rub and, you know, work that knot out. 
until she could find some type of relief and then it would go away. So think about that in terms of are we, if we, if we deal with an anger issue all the time, do we, does it show up all the time or is that particular events, particular trigger points, um, irritations, or maybe uh, particular memories, maybe not just anger, but maybe particular memories brings a great spirit of sorrow on us. For, for example, I was having a conversation with my mom yesterday, and we were talking about how a lady goes down and visits the grave of her husband every single, I don't, I can't remember, did she say every single day or every single week? Every week she goes down and visits the grave of her dead husband. That spirit of sorrow, I'm going to tell you, probably when she visits, she's probably in tears every single time she goes down there. Why? Because that spirit of sorrow or grieving, a grieving spirit, as she allowed to come in, that she made a promise. She made a uh, vow, maybe even to her dying husband, I will, um, I will grieve over you every day. I will cry over the loss every day. Or she made it to herself that she, and so she made that vow and what did it do? It opened up a door that this grieving spirit would be upon her and she has to go. It's almost like impelling. If she doesn't go, she'll feel guilty to go visit that grave. I mean, my mom says, I mean, I, she goes, I haven't been to the graveside since the day we put that, that urn into the ground. She didn't want to, his dad's gone. The memory of him still lives, but why? I mean, it's just a, it's just a stone representing where he's at now. Or where his ashes are, for example. Yeah, Twyla. It's a choice. A choice. I had somebody come. Which is which is related to the soul, the mind, the will, and the motion. Or we choose. We go left or right. You know. One of the ladies came up. We played cards that afternoon. She came up, and we were getting ready to have our meeting, and she said, uh, "What do you want to do about uh, Jared?" And I looked at her and I said, "What?" And she says, "Well, that your anniversary is this week." And we will honor it if you want us to. And I said, no, that's over. And now that doesn't mean I didn't love it. Yeah. But I am not going to go make a ritual out there and go visit all the time. So uh -huh. that's a choice you make. Yeah, exactly. It, and it, it's not dishonoring to the dead. Well, and the Bible says under the, uh, uh, the song that uh, we need to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, mm -hmm. not go down there again. Well, and how much of that, as far as, you know, those that visit graves and stuff opens up to the necromancy as well, that, that opens that door? Because how many people go out and actually speak to the dead? Speak to the dead. If they do, yes. That's a really an interesting point. Uh, you know, there's a whole Jewish sect that goes to a particular grave, the grave of Akiva, every year. And they do a, a, a prayer vigil with candles and all that sort of stuff. But Which is directly against scripture. It is, exactly. So... This lady that came and asked me that, she says, I'm just like you. She says, that's a thought that passes. And you go on. Because it's yeah yeah so so this whole idea I, I'm gonna have to say what what's so influenced Kura and those 250 to stand against Moses Yeah. Well, I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but there is a spirit or something in people. Like, uh, that other bunch didn't do it right. We can do it right. 
kind of like communism. There's always a group working through communism, but it never has worked. So uh -huh. They want to do it, it's so let everybody else do the wrong. <laughs> well, that's the way I look at it. They, they looked at probably Aaron's son and said, well, they didn't do it right, but we will. They're not as polished as us. Yeah. We're 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 more polished. Yeah. I mean, follow the money, follow the ego. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I, I think these things that this this tour portion brings out is is uh it really should give us pause to think that when we understand that it's a kingdom versus kingdom thing. Uh, look how easy, how easy the spirit can come in, especially, uh, especially, well, how many, let me put it in, in this, how many Torah communities became multiple Torah communities because some, because everybody wanted to be the teacher they wanted to be the rabbi i mean think about how many oh um that's why there's too many denominations how many denominations like last count i don't know there's like thirty-seven thousand. are you kidding Thirty-seven thousand denominations you know one would probably could probably say well we are a denomination because we're not like any of the others. So therefore we're separate. And so even though we are a local congregation, we also are a denomination. I wouldn't say that, but that depending on the definition, I don't know how Barna calculates denominations and what, what actually is one versus what, what's not, but there's, but all I have to say is what we, what we do and how we operate here today may be different next year. Because we just want to hear what the Spirit of God is saying right, and follow that direction. Because it is this, because I'm like, there's so many, you know, that everybody can't be, you know, if they're supposed to be following me in, you know, one way, they, why is there too many denominations? So it just it never makes sense. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't. But it, I think it relates to Korah. I mean, from the original split when you had, for, well, the original split was when you had those that, that were considered a sect of Judaism, and then it became the 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 Catholic branch, and and yet that and anybody that wasn't like of the Catholic branch, you know, that kept the Shabbats and they kept the feast days, then then they were considered they were the ones that were an, is it anathema? Is that the word? They were considered heretics. And and should be killed, and should be slaughtered. They'd be persecuted. But then you also had the Eastern Orthodox. Now, last week I was calling them Russian Orthodox, but it's the Eastern Orthodox, which covers you know, the Greek Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, the, the kind of the Syrian Orthodox group. I mean, it's all they're all related, and they're all uh, very very similar. But we have that major split, that East versus West. I, I said last week I was talking about it. I think there's a direct correlation between what's going on right now in Ukraine and Russia is it goes beyond just this military thing going on. I think it's religious. I think there's a spirit behind it. And, and one side is trying to defend itself from another spirit that is being invaded. And the one that's invading right now is, uh, is backed by the, the three branches I talked about. The Washington D.C. military branch, the Rome, with the religious branch, and um, and London, the financial branch. All right, and so this whole thing is 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 being worked up, and and so what is the current event that relates to Korok right now? There's a Korok rebellion going on right now in Russia. I don't know if anybody has picked up on the news on that, but there is. Uh, um, Prigozhin, who is the leader of a uh, private military group, it's called uh, um, Wagner, Wagner PMC, 
Wagner private military company, corporation, whatever. And he has taken some 25,000 of his own troops and they're moving to Moscow right now. They uh, moved in and they've taken over one of the buildings in a, in a place called Rostov, uh, a military headquarters in Southern Russia. And they are taking and they're on their way. And he's pronounced, he said, it's time for a new leadership in Russia. Why? Because he thinks he would be better off. He's splitting the nation. He's trying, he's Cora. And why? Because someone implanted in his head that he's bigger than who he really is. Right. And, and therefore, and because he already has his own military, he has the weapons that were given to him by Russia but he has his weapons, he has his tanks, he has his military um, vehicles, everything that he needs, and he's moving to Moscow. And he thinks that he can get the people of Russia to gather around him and support this movement so they can overthrow the government of Russia. I personally believe that, so, that I believe that the CIA and MI6 are completely involved and that they have offered him and that they're actually, I actually came across this earlier today that they are, that they offered him $6 billion. Wow. I, so wow. London, the CIA, MI6 related to the, to the also to London and also Washington DC. And because Rome has been trying to negotiate with him, they, with, with Ukraine and the whole, peace process. I think that personally that he has come under their influence. They made him an offer. He couldn't refuse it. If he had turned around, stop fighting Ukraine and split the government and overtake the government of Russia. And that's what, that's what the West has been wanting to do the whole time. How much has Putin been maligned over the last 10 years? Mm -hmm. And how much have they said, Oh, he's got cancer. Or he's not well, he's got this disease or that, and he's still healthy and he's still walking. Well, was it right? Is it true that he had any of those stuff? No. And so, oh, he's evil. And they, they, they compare him to Hitler. They compare him say it's all his fault that all this has happened without talking about what all they, what all the West has done to build up the process to, pull Russia into a conflict that they didn't want to be in in the first place. That's a whole nother story. So, um, so now Korah rebellion, isn't it interesting in this week's Torah portion, this is a major spirit of Korah that is going in and to overtake the leadership in Russia. So this thing is hitting dimensionally and you think, well, they're not even Torah believers. They're not even a congregation. They're not, because this guy was inspired, people were speaking into his ear. He's probably been offered lots of money. And if he can take over the government of Russia, they'll set him up as the new leadership of Russia. And the West will have their way with that nation and take all their resources. So glad you're talking current events. I'm so glad. So this puts it all together. Korah's rebellion happening during this week's tour portion. Mm -hmm. Wake up, so, uh, in fact, we actually talked about this uh, on Monday and Eddie and Tammy brought it out. So a lot of times they don't even want to talk about Cora and actually do this tour portion because sometimes it's historically happened in many congregations after talking about this tour portion that divisions take place, that there's church splits congregational splits they don't want to hear the truth. and that it's a spirit that's brought in. Yes. And so we must be on our guard because realize, remember it's kingdom versus kingdom. And that spirit wants to enter in yeah. and it's going, it wants it want it, what it wants to do is take someone who wants to be that congregational leader and makes their voice loud mm -hmm. and those that are not aware instead of saying, I'm not listening to that. My soul's not going to connect with you because you're a, you're out of line. And then uh, they, they can detach themselves emotionally and say, I'm not going to get drawn into your half truths and your uh, little wily ways. But that's not scriptural because 
he's prophecies all the way through the Bible, right and left, it's all the way through. And you've got to keep up with current events because the prophecies that are going on. And he puts one together with another together with another together. If you're not aware and you have your head in the sand because, oh, that's too much for me. Well, guess what happens? When things start going down, you're going to go, what? What? You and know, there's, there's, there's statements like, uh, I can explain it better. I actually know more. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 I'm uh -huh. the smartest. You need to listen to me. Uh -huh. and, and it gets it's it gets into those little bitty groups. As yeah, well. you know, listen to the pronouns that are being used, right? The accusatory, you, 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 and and then the me, me the I. Sorry, no. Yeah, yeah, no, it's true. It, you're, you're, good point. Eddie and Tammy said, um, this guy going into Russia has a hundred times more than Cora. Two hundred fifty-two thousand. Two hundred fifty thousand. Yeah. So, but if you think about it, okay, and this is what I've said about prophecy in the past. A lot of people say, "Well, God's in control, right?" How many have heard that? Um, yeah. As things things are being played out, God's in control because he gave us the prophecy. He gave us the book of Revelation. He told us in Daniel, he gave us these other prophets. He told us what was going to happen in our future. God's in control. He laid it out as if there's no free will. Do you, you know what I've said about that, right? That I disagree with that philosophy. Doctrinally, that's what the church has told us for 2000 years. Yes. Since the third century. Well, God's in control. He gave us these prophecies. It'll work out just like he planned it. No, I believe that God knows humans so well and the work of Hasatan so well. And because he could see the future, he said, you have a free will to choose, but because your free will will lead you down these paths, this is your end. And the red horse is going to ride and the black horse and the white horse. And, and these things... Uh, the pale horse or the green horse is going to ride. These things are going to happen to the earth because your free will led to the advent. And that's why we say there's been a lot of anti christ right? Anti-Messiah figures mm -hmm. that have arisen because it's the same human pattern that happens over and over again. So when we look at the things in the book of Revelation, he's not saying this is my will that it be done. He just said these are going to happen. I want you to be forewarned, but you have a choice and I'm not manipulating these events. I'm calling you to me and you'll be protected from it. Is that, do you see where the difference is? Mm -hmm. The difference is I have no free choice. I have no free will. I'm living in this age that I'm living in. And therefore what comes, comes. And that's where people get the thing of, well, that, you know, just rapture me out. That's how I'm just going to, I'm going to survive this thing because I got the Jesus peace. And, and so um, I'm going to be protected and I don't have to plan or prep or prepare. If we would lay on our face before God like Moses, that wouldn't happen. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think this whole thing with Cora's Rebellion tell, tells us so many different things. It tells us what spirit are we going to listen to. Ah. It's, it tells us that we have choices that God laid it out, we can follow his protocol or we can still go to the wrong fire pit and get the wrong coals. But the result is not, is not because he, he said, you, you don't have the right to choose not to get the fire from the, the wrong place. It's that you're the, because your spirit's tainted, you don't know the difference. You don't know where to get that fire from. You, 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 in your own pride, you don't, you think that part of the scripture doesn't even apply to you anymore oh. because you have the Jesus peace. You're protected. You've got the Holy Spirit. You've got all these different things, but really, is it the Holy Spirit or is it a Kundalini spirit? Is it a false spirit? Is this, are you, are you inspired by something that sounds because it's masquerading as an angel of light? It sounds so good. It has the pieces of truth in it. So therefore, 
we have 37,000 <laughs> denominations. <laughs> and, and it was like, well, let's just simplify it. Let's go back through this Torah cycle again, and let's see what the word has to tell us about. You know, that's one thing about why did I bring up Mark? Why? Because when, when you think about it, these people were destroyed, and it says that God sent the plague. Did God send the plague? Or was it Hasatan taken, you know, because he came to kill, steal, and destroy? Yes. Because at some point in time, I heard someone talk about this saying, well, because, you know, there's always this debate. Did God kill them? Or did their wrong choices open a door so that the spirit of Hasatan who comes to kill, steal, and destroy was allowed to come in because yes. they turned their back on God and the yes. protection was dropped. That hedge of protection was not there. And the enemy, knowing that this is God's people that he took out of, out of Egypt and is going to the promised land, and therefore, why not destroy God's promise by destroying his people and getting them to follow after leadership that is false, uncovered, not walking under. I mean, surprised that they didn't have like this big old open area in the cloud that they had to sit in that heat of the day where the rest of the camp that wasn't with them was still in the cool of the day. Right. I don't, I don't know. Just, just a thought, but, but nevertheless, they were separated out because where they got their fire from was ultimately the, not the deciding factor, but it, it was the, um, was the, well, it was, it's, it's what they clothed themselves. It yes. showed their heart. Yes. yes, Terry. It just brings us back the uncover to Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them, which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chicks under her wings, and he would not. You know, what verse was that? Matthew 23, 37. I think we are all at some point guilty of the easiest way. Yep. And if something sounds good and you get it all and it's an easier path to take, then there's a possibility if we don't watch it. We do. Uh, they didn't say there's been anything easy about them. You don't know that by the Israelites, it's supposed to be you know. Well, and it goes back to that old saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That's right. So I have something else I want to bring in. Let me see if I can find the verse. Uh Y'all bear with me as I look it up. What is it? That wasn't it. Um, so James and John, as a ya Yaakov and John, uh, the two brothers, they were called the sons of thunder, yeah. right? Do you remember the incident? And I, I just have to research it, that they – they spoke to Yeshua because there was somebody that wasn't following them or what Yeshua had said. And they said, do you want us, Yeshua, do you want us to call down fire from heaven? So can someone find that for me? Do you think that relates to this? What were they thinking? And Yeshua gave them an answer. And Yeshua said, you do not do not know what spirit you are of. Luke 9.24. Luke 9.54. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, and asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from the heaven to destroy them? Yeah. Jesus turned to them and rebuked them. 
Yeah, yeah. So backing up to first 51, and it came about when the days uh, were approaching for his ascension that he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem and he sent messengers on ahead of him and they went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make arrangements for him. And they did not receive him because he was journeying with his face toward Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James or Yaakov and John, Yochanan saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? And he, he turned and rebuked them. You do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went on to another village. Okay. Does that, let's tie that back into Korah's rebellion. What was the reason for the fire to come down and destroy the men that were carrying the censers with the strange fire? If they were allowed to live, what would have what would it what would have happened to the whole congregation? They could have come under the plague, but if if the plague didn't start, it would have it would have divided and conquered the entire nation. So they had to be removed. In other words, God says, wait a minute, you don't know what spirit you are of. And in other words, what were they thinking? What were the disciples, John and James thinking? They're like, wow, this is rebellion against God. Should they not show hospitality? Shouldn't they show, uh, and they're not doing it. So they don't have the right spirit in them. They, they're, they're not shemine. They're not listening to God. They don't know who's coming. I wonder how they got so be, far off. So, so they're thinking they need to protect and preserve the reputation of Yeshua and wipe stinking thinking off the planet. Yep. And Yeshua rebukes them where they think what they're doing is they're protecting the protocol of the king and his honor. If, if God did not wipe these guys out, what would people have thought about the protocol of his kingdom? It seems like the reverse is happening here, but what we have is a protocol that has to be preserved there in the wilderness. And therefore they would have to come under the same judgment as Aaron's son, Nadav and Abihu. Abihu. Because it's, you know, you can't have two gods. He's God. He makes the rules. Daryl. A little leaven. A little leaven. Yeah. A little leaven. I, I really think that these are related, and except they didn't realize, I don't think James and John actually understood what they were talking about. They just saw that when, when there was uh, problems in the camp, those problems were removed to preserve the life of the camp. Now, isn't it interesting that, that we don't see that today? Why? Because it's the same mercy that Yeshua is talking about. Says, That's not what I want. Love will conquer it all. So we'll just go a different direction. It's not worth the fight because the fight's going to come later on. That battle is for another day. Because why? Why did Israel... Why, why did Israel... Uh, sit in Egypt for as long as they did because the sin the iniquity in the land of Canaan had to reach a certain boiling point by which judgment could come so that iniquity was allowed to live in the land until the time had come and it was allowed to go another 40 years because Israel forgot what spirit they were of. Mm -hmm. So, so why do we think 
America is going to be allowed to live another year, two years, five years. That iniquity point is probably getting really close yeah. to that line. Yeah. I asked that in my opinion. On the Harold Turner radio show report uh, article uh, was talking about what this conflict, this thing with this rebellion in Russia. If the wrong heads get in the wrong power, this thing could go nuclear. If the, if the hardliners got in control of Russia, they wanted, they wanted to go nuclear six months ago. And, but, but at what point in time does the thing get so bad that judgment actually does fall? And we shouldn't be surprised when judgment falls on America and America has a complete collapse. We'll know that iniquity reached its, its boiling point. And so, and why, why would it come? Because God in his mercy is doing everything he possibly can to give us that time for us to be able to make the right decisions and reject in the middle of pride month to reject these, the evil. And that's not the only thing, by the way, that, just many things to be able to return to him, even for the church to repent and say, God, we're sorry for following our traditions and doctrinal ways and turned away from your word, elevating our ways above your Torah. Because after all, it doesn't apply to us anymore. We got the new Testament. I mean, to allow us to come back, even the point of, of there's five virgins and five, there's 10 virgins, five and five, five virgins that had extra oil that went in and five that's an equal number think about that an equal number that go in and then the door is locked and what do, do we have five and five right now if you think about messianic believers hebrew believers and those that are not do we have five and five right now i would say so no i don't no. think we do i think we might barely have one one in nine. There still needs to be an awakening and a revival for people to come to the heart of the scriptures once again, which is the heart of God, which is Yeshua, the way, the truth, and life, which is an idiom for the first five books yes, of the Bible. I agree with that, but you know what? I've heard people say, well, this this prophecy hadn't happened and this prophecy hadn't happened. You know, God is God and he can contradict anything. If he wants to blow this earth up, he will. Well, I'm going to disagree no. with you, though. I'm going to disagree with you based on what I just already said. He's already well. He can do that. He's not. But that's not in his. But that would be contrary. He can do that sooner than what he's. But that's contrary to his character. Yeah. It's well, not his character. His character is for life. So, yes. but he knows the destruction. That's why I said Bible prophecy is because he knows the end from the beginning. He's just told it, but our free will takes us to that end. That's what I'm saying. There's so much. Okay. So the destruction of this earth, there will be a new heaven and earth, yes. but that's not for a thousand years okay. or more. I don't know if I agree with that, but we all have our right to our opinions. That's what Revelation says, that there'll be a new heaven and new earth. Yes, but so, I mean, there's such but, but we have been given a free will. And this is some people will disagree with me, but Calvinism is is that philosophy is very strong where some people make it in and some don't because some are chosen and some are not. And we've all been given a free will, but that free will has allowed our nation to get to where we are today, that we've hit in that point of judgment, that this this nation deserves the same judgment as Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what I'm saying. I mean, it's gotten so bad. You can't even watch TV anymore without a gay, two gay couples in it. I mean, that's just one of many things. There, we've got uh, kids being raped. We've got Hollywood that is the pe pedophile capital of the world and, and uh, Illuminati is taking over. But, I mean, there's so many things going on. But are those not, are those not just symptoms? It's just in well, our face. Things, but I mean, no, they're, they're just in our face now because before they weren't in our face. It was happening. It's yeah, just not in our face. But it's gotten worse and so, worse and worse. So the point of what we've seen since 2016 and they put the multicolored lights on the, on the, uh, on the White House uh -huh. 
has accelerated the whole problem. It's put it in our face that much more. And when it puts it in our face, is it is it in our face or is it really in God's face? Yes. Because it, because this whole thing with Korah is um, it's not that they were questioning Moses and Aaron. There's questioning God's choice and God's authority to so that this nation can operate and work together and get to the promised land to so that that prophetic word would be fulfilled. Their choices delayed it. And that's why I say Bible prophecy is God's told us, but it, it's because our free will got us there, not because he he did he took away our choices and made us go down this path. But also he says nobody's going to know the time. And he, yes, and I know we have this Bible and this Bible is to go by and prophetic things are to, to uh, see. And it gives us the road signs. But he says nobody's going to know the time. So even if you say a thousand years, you know, he, he, I just believe he could change his mind any time. So, um, so let me put it, th let me also clarify. I want to clarify something, Jackie. So let me clarify the great tribulation. Yeah. Uh, the great tribulation is just a door. It's not the end of the world. It's not the destruction yes. of heaven uh -huh. and earth. It's the door to the millennial reign of Messiah. Because he's going to come back Andy. and set up his kingdom. I love it. Do you think the Father realized how, how this would play out? The fall of Hosanna or the fall of man? When did the Father see the end from. Because, I mean, his original plan was not this. Mm -hmm. At some, did, you think you may have seen that at the fall of Hosanna? I mean, when he allowed it. When about his pride followed his will, <coughs> his means would that have been a signal to the body? No, we got to let this play out over the next you know, several thousand years. <coughs> I, I would say, so my thought is this, is that is because uh, because Yahweh is all knowing, He knows the end from the beginning. I he, that He He understood by taking the risk, by giving man free will, the ultimate without His divine intervention at certain points, uh, man would ultimately destroy himself. That's right. And that there would ultimately be in the end that we're told about in Daniel and Zechariah and the book of Revelation. Um, but think about this. I mean, he there there was the intervention of the great flood. Why? Because there's this kingdom versus kingdom in Hasatan and his fallen angels. Um, are a you know they them and their influences brought the entire world down except for Noah and his family and so divine intervention reset the clock and divine intervention uh, reset the clock with with uh, Abraham and divine intervention reset the clock how many different times with Moses he stood in the gap to protect the people and Yeshua divine intervention, you know, but I believe that God knew that at that certain injection points, just like Hasatan had certain injection points in order to shift humanity, that that God's not going to be out trumped by it. And I, and so, but ultimately it bought us another 2000 years with Yeshua. Long before, the, I mean, we had the flood, but we also had where where the father stepped in and he took out Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm -hmm. Now, do I believe that that could happen currently? I definitely do. Mm -hmm. 
That's what I'm saying. There's something going to go down. But that doesn't yeah. mean it is the final thing. Mm -hmm. It means it's going to control a specific area. And that's a really good point because remember, uh, Joel, uh, no, um, Jonah, okay? Nineveh was going to be destroyed. Jonah said, well, that's a good thing. I don't want to go and tell them because they'll repent. They need to be destroyed. Don't you see what they're doing? He ultimately gets there, says, judgment's coming. Look, and I believe that's what the Planet 7X was coming, and it was bringing its debris trail, and they were going to get hit. The people repented, and God moved it. And Jonah said, man, I've been preaching that for 40 days, they repented. It's not going to happen. And they deserved it. And he threw a fit. But that was divine intervention by an intercessor, just like Moses was a divine, divine intervention for, for what if we look at it, the enemy comes to kill, steal and destroy this plague that begins to hit the people in this tour portion. And Moses picks up the censer and runs or tells Aaron to run in between the dead and the living and protects the living because of divine intervention to protect it because Hasatan wants to kill, steal and destroy. Yeah, and that's the right whole thing. Right. This whole thing that's happening from a world war, breaking out world war, thermal nuclear uh, destruction uh, to all these different things. We know by scripture that God, that there is a remnant <coughs> that is preserved. But it's not simple. There's nothing. Simple. We don't know how many that is, and and uh, but then again, remember, I, I like to look at well five and five, whatever five and five it is, half go in. You got a 50 chance. Yeah. Well, I think that's enough for today, and uh, <coughs> hope I hope that was a worthwhile discussion. Got yes, something out of that. Yes.